Simon says subscribe and click on the bell icon to receive notifications. My name is Deborah Ashby and I'm a Microsoft trainer. I've been supporting and training Excel for over 25 years now. And as you can probably tell from the accent, I'm based in London in the United Kingdom. And I'm extremely happy to be your host for today because we have a very exciting topic to discuss advanced formulas in Excel. And I always find with this type of webinar, it is a little bit more of a difficult one because what some people consider to be advanced, um, other people don't. So it's trying to pitch it at the right level so that we can account for everybody. And what I would say is if you are looking to become an advanced Excel user, really it has much more to do with being able to look at your spreadsheet, being able to look at a problem that you have and knowing which formulas you need or which combination of formulas you need in order to solve your problem or achieve your goal. And that type of knowledge really comes over the time, but the basis is obviously knowing how each of the formulas work. So we're going to focus on some of the more advanced ones today and take a look at some of the different ways that we can use them. So this webinar is going to be pitched more towards people who already have an intermediate to advanced understanding of Excel. So what I mean by that is I'm not going to be going through a lot of the, the basics and explaining those basic concepts. So I'm sort of making an assumption that if you're joining this webinar, you're sort of already reasonably familiar with some of the uh, more basic functions, the so sum, count, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Maybe you've used VLOOKUPs or index and match before. You understand the concept behind apps absolute cell referencing, things like that. So I am going to make that basic assumption because this is an advanced webinar and we want to get on to the advanced stuff. So just be aware of that. The other thing to point out is that some of the formulas I'm going to use today, and I've tried to keep these to a minimum, are some of the newer ones, which are only available in Excel for Microsoft 365, which I think these days is what most people are using, and also the latest standalone version, so Excel 2021. The majority of things I'm going to cover are available in most of the versions which people use these days, so you shouldn't have too much of a problem. So with all that out of the way, the final thing. As I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording, um, I think within the next couple of days. So if you find I'm going a bit too fast for you in this webinar, then use that recording, go through it at a slower pace along with the spreadsheet and work through it that way. It's always a good thing to do, I find afterwards. All right, let's take a look at today's agenda. Now we're going to start out with good old VLOOKUPs. Everybody loves VLOOKUP. It's one of the most popular functions in Excel. And if you're already familiar with VLOOKUP, that's going to be great. I'm going to show you how you can use VLOOKUP in a couple of different ways. I'm going to show you how you can use wildcards in your VLOOKUPs and also how you can solve a common problem, which I hear all the time. And that is when you're trying to look up something where you have duplicate lookup values, how can we get around that? How can we do that? So we're sort of going to extend our knowledge of VLOOKUP in the first section. I will start out showing you a very basic VLOOKUP just to make sure that we're all on the same level, but I'm not going to linger on that for too long. We're then going to go into just a little bit about just some really useful things in Excel, combining and splitting text. I'm going to show you a few different methods. We're going to use some text functions. I'm also going to show you a couple of other things which don't necessarily fall under the bracket of formulas, but can be extremely useful as a replacement for formulas. We'll then move on to index and match. Again, look up formulas. These are so important. I'm going to show you a basic index match, and then I'm going to show you how you can make that more advanced, how you can use index and match with multiple pieces of criteria. And we'll then move into two super important functions. And I say two, it's effectively four, because whilst we cover count ifs and some ifs, I'm also going to show you count if singular and some if as well. If you type into uh, Google the most important functions to know, these two always come up. So it is important to know how these work. We're going to talk a little bit about logical uh, statements, logical formulas, so things like if statements. And again, we're going to move it on a little bit. I'm going to show you how you can do things like nested if statements and also how you can combine if with other uh, logical functions like and and or and um, use multiple criteria effectively. 
And then the last part of this lesson, this is where we're going to move into some of the newer functions that are available in Excel. I'm going to start out by showing you the filter and the sort functions because those are pretty cool. And then if your brains aren't fried at that point, then they probably will be when we take a look at this last one. And if any of you are really into Excel and you follow Excel, then you've probably heard about Lambda. It is a new function in Excel. I say new in the last sort of six months or so. And this is probably one of the biggest game changers when it comes to working with Excel that there has been in the last few years. What Lambda allows you to do is basically create your own functions and formulas and use them throughout your workbook. So we're going to take a little look at that as well. OK, so hopefully this sounds OK to you and we're going to kick off with Avvi lookups. So let's come out of here and just bear with me while I transfer across to my spreadsheet, which I should have down here somewhere. There it is. All right, so we're going to start out on the VLOOKUP wildcards tab of the spreadsheet if you're following along. Now, I'm just using a very small data set for this first example. I just have a very small table. It's not actually a table. I haven't formatted it as a table as yet. It contains some serial numbers in column A. We then have product codes in column B, the product name in column C, and the price in column D. And this data is sort of very suitable for doing something like a VLOOKUP. So it might be that you have a serial number and I'm just going to grab one from over here and stick it over here. Oh, my Excel has decided to crash. Oh, no, there it is. <laughs> and paste it over here. But what it might be is that you have a serial code or something like this and you want to find the product related to this specific serial code. So this is kind of the scenario where you would use something like a VLOOKUP. So I am just quickly going to recap a very basic VLOOKUP and then we're going to sort of extend its capabilities. So if I want to find this in this table, what I can do is type in equals VLOOKUP. Now remember, with our formulas, we have our arguments underneath and the one in bold is the one that we're focusing on now. So the first argument here is the lookup value. Now, when you're doing any kind of lookup, your lookup value is basically the information that you'll want to look up in the table. So for me, that is going to be this serial code that we have in cell F4. That's my lookup value. Press comma. I then need to tell Excel where I want to look up this serial code. So I want to look this up in this table. So my table array is the entire table, A3 to D11, comma. The next part of the VLOOKUP is we need to tell Excel, OK, once you've found this serial code in this table, which column of information do we want to return? Well, I'm looking for the product. So I need to tell Excel that I'm looking for the information in the product column of this table. Now, the way that VLOOKUP works that out is it basically numbers columns in a table from left to right, starting with the number one. So the serial number column is going to be number one, product code number two, product number three, so on and so forth. So if I want to return the product, that's going to be column number three. And then the final argument on the end here is we just need to tell Excel if we want to exactly match that serial code in the table or if we want to approximately match it. Now, in this scenario, I want to exactly match the serial code in the table. So my argument on the end is a false. Now, remember, when it comes to true or false in Excel, you don't have to type false. You could type a zero, which also means false. If you wanted to do a true, that would be a one. OK, so that there is your very basic VLOOKUP. Let's hit enter and see what we get. We get door hinge. Now, is that correct? Well, yes, it is. If we look at our table, the product for that serial code is door hinge. OK, so that is your very, very basic VLOOKUP. Really easy to put together. Let's take a look at a different scenario when it comes to using VLOOKUP. Now, what about, I'm just going to delete this out and also this. And what about if I want to do a lookup where I'm only using part of the serial number? 
So maybe instead of having the whole serial number written out in column F, I have just this second set of four characters. So for example, HYNH for the first one or JNYH. So I'm not referencing the full serial number. I just want to look up that code in the middle. How can I do that? Well, let's take a look. If I type in the first one, so HYNH, maybe I have that there and I want to return the product where that is part of the serial number. So that should be light bulb. Now, if I was just to do a regular VLOOKUP here, so if we just type in VLOOKUP and I use this as the lookup value and I'm looking that up in the table, this is basically what we did last time. I want to return the product, which is column number three and I want to do an exact match. Now, I'm gonna put a false on the end there. It's not going to work because it's looking for exactly this in the table and that effectively doesn't exist on its own. What about if we edit our formula, maybe on the end here, instead of a false, where we're doing an exact match of the lookup value, what about if I put a true on the end there for an approximate match, let's see. Is that working? Well, not really. It's bringing back something that's further down. Now, notice that that also has, has HYNH, but it's not working in the way that I want it to work. So how can we do this? Well, one way that we can do it is we can use wildcards in our lookup. Now, if you're not sure what I mean by a wildcard, an example I would give would be if you were working in, let's say you were working in a Word document. And maybe somewhere in the text in your Word document, you had the words, let's say United States and United oops, Kingdom. And you wanted to find everything in the Word document that started with the word United, regardless of what was after it. So what you might probably do is search for something like United Asterix, which will pull back United States and United Kingdom. Now, we apply that concept of using the asterisk to our formula. All right, so let me just clear what we have in here. And what we can basically do is we can construct a lookup value based off of um, our wildcard characters. So what I can do here is I can say equals lookup my lookup value. Now, my lookup value needs to have a a essentially asterisk, H-Y-N-H, asterisk, because I want it to find everything before and everything after as well. So how do we construct that within our VLOOKUP formula? Well, an asterisk is considered to be text, so it needs to go in quote marks. So what I could say here is quote mark, asterisk, quote mark, and then we want to join that. Now, the symbol for joining two pieces of text or strings together in Excel is the ampersand sign. So I want to join it with F4 and then ampersand again. And then we want asterisk afterwards. That is our lookup value. I'm looking it up in the table array so we can select that. Comma. I want to return the product, uh, the product that's associated with this serial code. So that is still going to be column number three. And I want to do an exact match. So we have a false on the end there. Enter, and it's now going to return the correct one. If I change this to something else, if we put in QUTB, for example, we should find that that updates, okay? So don't be afraid. When it comes to your lookup values, you can kind of combine things together, like use wildcards. You can even combine other pieces of text together to create a lookup value that you can then use in your lookup formula, okay? So that is sort of how you can use wildcards when you're doing a lookup, if you just want to find part of something in your table. All right, so that is your wildcard characters. Now, something we saw a little bit earlier is if we look at this table, notice that we have some duplicates in here, or we have one duplicate, I should say. So in the serial number column, we have serial number and we have the same serial number right at the end just here. And this is something that I hear so often from different people. How do I do a lookup when I have duplicate values um, in my lookup field, essentially. 
And there are a couple of different methods that you can use to do this. One I very much prefer over the other. And we'll start out with the one that I prefer. So what we're going to do is let's, uh, I'm just going to get rid of that product just there. And I think what I'm going to do is let's just paste all of these serial numbers, control C. I'm just going to put these over here. So what we can do here is if we have duplicates or if our lookup value is going to be a duplicate, like it is for this first one, because we also have it further down, what we need to do is create our own unique identifier for each row in this table. So effectively create a unique ID so that the VLOOKUP can work. Now, if I do this, um, I would look at my data and maybe think about how I might create a unique identifier for each row in my table. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a column and we're going to call this a helper column. I love my helper columns in Excel. And what we're going to do is if I look at my data, I've got my serial number. And then in column C, I have what we call a product code. So even though we have the same serial number for the first row and the last row, they have different product codes. So what I could effectively do is combine or join together the serial number and the product code. And that is going to effectively give me a unique identifier for that row because this bottom one is going to be different to this top one because they have different product codes. So again, what we can do here is we can just type in equals. and I'm going to say join this cell. We have a little ampersand symbol in there if we're going to join it with data in another cell join it together with the information in this cell. And that gives me a unique identifier. So now if I drag this down and just widen that out, I now have unique values or a unique identifier for each row in this table. So now the question that people normally ask after that is, OK, well, that's fine. I've got my unique identifier, but I don't necessarily want to have the unique identifier listed over here. I want people to be able to select the actual serial code as opposed to this new amalgamated code that I've created. So how can we do a VLOOKUP where we're looking up the serial code, but it's effectively finding the unique value in this column? Well, again, this comes to how we're constructing our lookup value. So once again, if we type in the lookup, tab, our lookup value, well, I can tell Excel how I've created this helper column effectively. So my lookup value is this and this. That's my lookup value, comma. Where do I want to look up that string? Well, I want to include my helper column in the table array. So A3 to E11 this time. Column index number. Well, I've got an extra column in here now. So the column that I want to pull back is the product column, which is now column number four. Do I want to do an exact match? Well, yes, I do. So let's do a zero, close the bracket and hit enter. Let's see if this works. If I double click to drag this down, Yes, it does. So you can see that even though this and this are effectively the same serial code, it's pulling back the correct value in the table because we're using a unique identifier. OK, so that is how you can handle VLOOKUPs if you have duplicate values as your lookup value. And of course, what you could then do if you wanted to tidy this up a little bit, you can right click and you can simply hide this column, tidy up your spreadsheet, make it look a little bit nicer. OK, so that sort of solves a common problem. It's something which people um, talk to me about all the time. How do you do that when you have duplicates? So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Now, as we were going through that, we were talking a little bit about using that ampersand symbol to join different things together. And I thought at this point, it might be a good opportunity just to move on to talking about text functions where we can use the ampersand symbol to join things together, because these are things that you're commonly going to have to do when you're working in Excel. So let's just move on to our text functions tab. And again, I just have some very basic examples to illustrate these points. 
Now, fairly frequently, this will be something that you have to do quite a lot when you're in Excel. It might be that you've received a spreadsheet from a client or maybe you've downloaded something from a third party system. Your data comes across and maybe it doesn't look exactly as you want it to look. So you have to do a certain amount of tidying up. And quite often it might be that you have pieces of information in different columns that you want all in one column, or maybe you have information in one column that you want to break across more columns. So it's important to know the different methods you can use to do this because it is such a common task. So let's take a look at how we do this using uh, the ampersand symbol that we were just looking at in the previous example. So what I have here is basically just three columns, very small data sets here. We have titles, we have people's first names and their last names. And my boss has said to me, I don't want these split across three columns. I want it to just say the full name in column D. So I'm like, OK, there's a few different methods that I can use here. Now, the first method is I can use that ampersand sign. So if I type in equals, all I need to do is say, OK, I want A4 ampersand. And if we want a space in between our words, we need to add that in as well. Now, a space is considered text. It's considered a character. So it needs to go inside quote marks. So quote space quote. We then have another ampersand symbol because we want to join that with the first name. Another ampersand symbol. We want another space in between the first name and last name. So quote space quote ampersand and then the last name. OK, so we use those ampersands whenever we want to join things together. It might be a cell reference. It might be some text that we have within quote marks. Hit enter and we get exactly what we're looking for using a very simple formula. Now, another way that we can do this the same thing essentially is to use the concat function. And again, this is a function that I use all the time. So let's type it in. Now, notice when I type that in underneath Excel's IntelliSense, where it tells you all of the functions available in Excel that are related to what you've typed in, we have concat and concatenate. Now, the bottom one, concatenate, has that little warning triangle over it. And that just basically means that that's kind of an older version of concat. Concat is the updated or the latest version. Now, if you're using a very old version of Excel, it might be that you only have concatenate. But I think these days most of us should be using concat. Now, concat does the same thing, but we just need to specify the text. We don't actually have to put in any ampersands in order to do this. So text one is what we have in cell A4, comma, text two. We still need to specify the space. Quote marks, space, quote marks, comma. Then we have the text in B4, quote mark, space, quote mark, and then we have the text in C4. Close the bracket, hit enter, and we get exactly the same result. So both of those methods using those text functions enable us to very quickly join strings together. A really important thing to know how to do because it's something you'll encounter all the time, particularly if you work with a lot of data sets. Now that I've said that, let me show you the best way of doing this, which isn't a function at all. Now, we can use something called flash fill in order to help us do this very quickly. So if I just type in an example of the first one, so I want it to say Miss Deborah Ashby. Now I'm going to press control enter. If you don't know what control enter does, it basically leaves you in the cell instead of moving to the cell underneath. That's what happens when you just press enter. So control enter will keep you in the same cell. What I can then do is jump up to the data tab. And in the data tools group, I have a flash fill button. If I click it like magic, it fills down all of those names so much quicker than using text functions. However, there is one caveat with flash fill. This only works if your data is all together. And what I mean by that is if I just delete these out, if I wanted to put the full name over here in column E3 or in cell E3, I should say, and we have a blank column in between, it's not going to work. So if I type in the first one, oops, can't even type my own name. There we go. <laughs> Control enter and then click flash fill. I'm going to get an error. 
And that's because it has to be right next to whatever it is that it's using to find the pattern. OK, so if you have a situation like this, flash fill isn't going to work. And that is where you need to be able to have that knowledge of text functions to be able to do it instead. OK, so just bear that in mind when you are uh, joining text together. Now, the reverse of that is to split text up. And splitting text up, I would say, is probably slightly more complex than actually uh, joining text together. So here we have the reverse situation. I have a full name column and I want to split this across different columns. Again, a very common scenario that you'll come across in Excel. Now, what I could do here is if I want to extract the title from column A, I could think about maybe using text functions. And you may have used these before. Common ones are things like left, right and mid. All three of those functions allow you to extract text from the left hand side of a cell, from the middle of the cell or from the right of a cell. So if I want to extract for this first one, the word miss, I'd want to extract it from the left hand side of the cell. So I'd use the left function. Now I only have two arguments here. This feels straightforward at this stage. My first argument is text. So I just need to uh, tell Excel the cell that contains the text I want to extract, so A12. And then I just tell Excel how many characters from the left-hand side of the cell do I want to extract. So if I want to extract the word miss, I'm going to say, OK, I want the first four characters. Close my bracket. I'm going to do a control enter. Now that's fine. But when I double click to copy this down, notice we have a problem. Because it's extracting four characters from each of these and for where we have Mr, that doesn't quite work out correctly. So how can we do this? We can't just use left. Well, this is where we need to take a look at our names just here. And I might say by looking at these names, well, I can see that I want to extract in each one of these everything before we have the first space. So what I can do is I can tell Excel to find the space and extract everything before. OK, so where we have find text, I'm going to say I want you to find a space. So again, in quote marks, space. I want you to find it within this cell. Close the bracket. Now, what this is going to do is it's going to tell me the position of that space. So for this first one, the space is in position five. For the second one, it's in position three, so on and so forth. Now that I have this information, I can utilize this in my left function to get the result that I want. So now if I type in left, I'm looking in this cell for my text, number of characters. Well, if I say I want to extract the first five characters for this first one, that's going to extract the word miss, but it's also going to extract the space. And if you want to include the space, that's fine, but most of the time you don't. So what we can do here is just add a minus one on the end. It's going to minus one character. Close the bracket, hit enter, and we should find now when we copy that down, we get exactly what we're looking for. OK, so that find command is really useful. You can use it with left, you can use it with mid, you can use it with right to extract or find things in a string and then extract from that point. OK, now if I was doing this for real and I've got these just here, I'm probably going to want to move those across to uh, the title column. And if I was to go in and delete these out, I'm going to get value errors because that formula is relying on those values in those cells. So let's control Z to undo that. Now, the trick I always use here is I select these cells and I do a copy paste paste values to throw away the formulas. So it's just going to leave me with the text and no formulas underneath. So control C. I'm going to go to home into paste and I'm going to say paste the values only over the top. That gets rid of those underlying formulas so I can now safely delete out my workings out and I can just simply move these across. OK, so text functions are really useful. I would recommend having a good read about those so that you understand how you can extract all different kinds of things from cells, no matter what the situation.
Now, the second way that we can extract things from cells is we could use flash fill once again. So I'll show you it again. I'm going to show you a quicker way of using flash fill. So if I want to extract the uh, first names, I'm going to type in the first one. I'm going to do control enter to stay in the same cell. What I can do is highlight the rest of the cells that I want to fill and press control E to flash fill down. OK, control E is the keyboard shortcut for flash fill. Remember, that is only going to work if it's right next to the rest of your data. If it's in a completely different column, then you're going to need to use text functions. The final way. The old classic, the old favorite. This isn't, again, technically a function, but because this is so important, I want to make sure that you know text to columns. You may have used this before, but it is so quick and easy to separate text out. All we need to do is select our column of data, go up to the data ribbon, and then click on text to columns. Now, our data is delimited. And what that means is where we have different words in our cells, we have, um, in this case, we have a space separating each of these words. That's what we mean by delimited. Our words are separated by something. It might be a space, it might be a comma, it might be a tab. So my data is delimited, so that's fine. Let's click on next. I then get to say what each of my words is separated with. So for me, it's separated with a space. And you'll see immediately in the data preview, it's showing me how it's going to split up that data. If I click on next again, the only other thing I would do here is in the destination, I want my data to be split starting in cell B12. And when I click on finish, it's going to split those across nicely for me. OK, so I know flash fill and text to columns aren't technically formulas, but I just wanted to show you um, situations. What I would use in general, I would use text to columns and flash fill as my primary way of doing this. But sometimes you can't use those. So it's good to have the backup knowledge of how to use text functions to do it as well. OK, lovely. All right, let's move across to our next spreadsheet, looking up multiple pieces of criteria. Now, this is where we're going to talk about index and match. Again, another lookup formula. I know you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, my God, so many lookup formulas. But honestly, these are some of the most commonly used formulas. It's really important that you know how to use them. And you can use them with other formulas in all different kinds of ways. And you can make them as simple or as complex as you like. Now, I'm going to show you, again, we are going to run through a very basic index and match, and just so that we're all on the same page. And then we're going to take it up a notch, and I'm going to show you how you can perform an index and match when you have multiple pieces of criteria. So we're taking up to that advanced level. Now, we're going to start down here with this little table of data. Again, a very small table. We have a list of items. We have some colors for those items, and then we have the price. And maybe I have a little table over here and I want to look up the color in this table and I want it to return the item associated with this color. Now, if you're thinking, well, can't we use VLOOKUP for that? Well, VLOOKUP has many, oh, I wouldn't say many limitations. It has one major limitation. And I'm going to highlight this to you now because this is a really important thing to add to your advanced knowledge. If you're looking at some data and you want to do a lookup, you need to be able to determine by looking at your data if you need to use a VLOOKUP or if you need to use index and match. OK, so let me explain to you the difference and the uh, disadvantage of using VLOOKUP. If I was to try and use a VLOOKUP here, so let's do that so you can see. If I try and do a VLOOKUP, lookup value, well, I'm looking up red. I want to look it up in this table, comma. What do I want to return? Well, I want to return the item. So again, using that principle in VLOOKUP of counting columns from left to right, the item column is column number one. So I'm going to put that in. Do I want to do an exact match? Do I want to exactly match the color red in the table? Yes, I do. So we're going to say false on the end here. Now, is this going to work? No, it's not. Why doesn't this work? Well, it's to do with this column number just here, the column index number. When you're working with VLOOKUP, as I mentioned, VLOOKUP only counts columns from left to right. One, two, three. 
Now, because the lookup value that I'm using, in this case, red, is in column number two, and what I want to return is in column number one, so effectively, I'm going right to left, it won't work, okay? It can only go left to right. It can't look backwards. Your lookup value always has to be to the left of what you want to return if you want to use VLOOKUP. So in this scenario, to get the information that I want to get using a VLOOKUP, I can't do it. So that is where my VLOOKUP comes unstuck. So this is where index and match comes in. It's a much more powerful way of looking up information, particularly if you have complex tables of data where your lookup values and what you're looking up are, could be in any column. So I find that it's better to learn how to use index and match as opposed to VLOOKUP because it's, it's a lot more applicable to more situations. Now, index and match, again, two words that tend to strike fear into the heart of anyone who works with Excel. And what we're going to do today is we're going to take all that fear away of index and match, and then we're going to pump it up a little and take it up to a more advanced level. Now, index and match in themselves are two separate formulas or functions. We have the index formula and we have the match formula. But you so often hear them used in combination. So you'll hear people say index match as if it's one formula. It's actually two different functions. So let's take a look at them separately so that you can see how they work when they're combined. So if we start out with index. Now with index, the first argument here is array. And the way to look at this is the array is always where your answer is contained. So I want to return the item. So my array is going to be this cell range just here. My answer is going to be in there. Okay, that is your array. Next argument is the row number. Now, the first thing I'm looking up here is red. So if I look at my table, because I have a very small table, I can see that red is in the first row. We're not counting the heading row. Red is in the first row. So I can say, okay, return row number one. Close the bracket, hit enter, and it's going to give me the correct answer. But I had to count down to find that row number. Now, I have a very small data set here. It's very simple for me to count down. But imagine if you have a spreadsheet that contains hundreds or even thousands or maybe even millions of rows. Do you want to spend time counting down, finding the row number that you want? No, you don't. So somehow we need to automate in Excel how to find this row number. And that is where the match function comes in. So let's see match on its own. Now, with match, we can say here, look up value. I can say, look up red. I want you to look it up in this range just here. And I want you to exactly match the word red. Close the bracket, hit enter. It returns the row number that it finds. So this is pretty much what I need in that index formula, the automating of finding that row number. So this is why we combine them together. This is why they're so powerful. So again, if we go from the top, index, our array is where our answer is contained. So it's going to be A20 to A25. Now I'm going to want to drag this formula down. So I'm going to lock these cell references in place by pressing F4, comma, row number. I want to get match to find the row number. So we're going to go straight into match. Lookup value is going to be the color F20. I want to look that up in this range of cells. Again, I'm going to drag this formula down. So I need to lock this cell range F4. And I want to do an exact match, zero on the end. Close off match, close off index, enter. And now I get my result. And I should find that if I double click, I can copy that down safely. So this is your basic index and match formula to perform a really flexible lookup. And in this, unlike VLOOKUP, it doesn't matter where or which column that lookup value is in, in this table, it can find anything. Okay, so really simple. 
I learned this by just practicing it loads and loads of times. So that's what I recommend you do. Just go over it until you can get that pattern in your head. But it really does help to understand what you're doing there, what the index function does and what the match function does. See, so when you can combine them together, you understand what you're doing. So with that in mind, let's take a look at a slightly more advanced version of index and match. Now, in the example we were just looking at, we basically were looking up one piece of criteria, and that was the color. I was looking for the color in this table, and I was returning the item that it was related to. Now, quite often, you will have more than one piece of criteria that you need to look up. And that is this example that we have at the top. So what we have here is we have a list of uh, travel companies, and we have a list of months running across the top. And what I want to basically do, and I've already uh, set up data validation lists for both of these, is I want to be able to select a month and I want to be able to select a travel company and have it return from the table what the sales figures were for that month for that company. Now, I have two pieces of criteria here. It needs to look up the travel company and it also needs to look up the month. OK, so we need to do an index and match, but we need to use two pieces of criteria. So how do we construct this? Well, let's go into our index. Again, the array, the array is where we're going to find our answer. Now, my answer, depending on what month I've selected and what travel company I've selected, my answer could be anywhere in this table of figures. So my array, my answer is going to be found somewhere in this block, B4 to M11, comma. It's now asking for the row number. So what do I have in my rows? I've got my travel companies in my rows. So I'm gonna do a match. And I'm gonna match the travel company first of all, because that's in the row, okay? So my lookup value is gonna be what we have in cell A14. Where am I going to look up that information? Well, I'm going to look it up in this cell range just here, A4 to A11. And I want to exactly match the name of the travel company in that range. So I want a zero on the end here. Close the bracket. That is our first match. We need to do another one because we need to look up by the year, sorry, by the month as well. So we're going to go into another match comma on the end. Notice we've now moved across to the column number argument for the index formula. So the columns, this is the months. So now we can do a match. This time the lookup value is going to be the uh, value that we have in cell B13, in this case June. We're going to look that up in this array up here. So all of the months. And we want to do an exact match. Close off match, close off index, hit enter, and we get our result. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's just do a quick spot check to make sure that this is correct. So June, air to go, where are we? There it is, just there. And I should find that if I change these, everything is going to update nicely. So just take a look at that formula. We've just got two matches in there. OK, so. This is how you can do a lookup when you have multiple pieces of criteria. All right. So that is the more complex version of index and match. All right. Quite a lot to take in. We've got quite a bit more to go, guys. So strap in. <laughs> Let's move on to count ifs and sum ifs. Now, I'm not going to linger too long on this because I think I demonstrated this in a webinar maybe a couple of months ago. Um, so I'm sure you can look this up online. But these are very, very important functions. So I might just demonstrate sum ifs because count ifs is pretty much exactly the same. If you know sum ifs, you know how count ifs works. And we are getting a bit pushed for time. Now, sum ifs basically allows you to do what we call an if, uh, sorry, <laughs> we want to do a sum that has conditions. So, for example, if we take a look at our uh, table just here, we have some sales agents, we have the company that they work for, we have their job title and the total sales that they've generated. Now, it might be that I want to work out the total of all of the sales for just the, uh, just, for just Microworld. OK, so I'm adding a condition in there, and that is that the company has to be microworld before we sum the sales. 
Now, if we just have one piece of criteria, this is where we would use some if, singular. Notice underneath, some if and some ifs. One piece of criteria, we use some if. We have three arguments just here, range, criteria, and some range. Now, I sort of feel they've structured this a little bit backwards because I like to say to myself, OK, what is my piece of criteria? Well, my criteria is that we're only summing if um, it's microworld. So my criteria is microworld. The range for that piece of criteria is this range just here, the company range, comma. My criteria is microworld. What do I want to sum? Well, I want it to sum the sales for basically all of Microworld. Close the bracket, hit enter, and we get our answer. So you're doing a calculation, but based on a condition. Now we use some ifs if we have more than one piece of criteria. So if you take a look at the next example, I want to find the total sales for all sales reps at Microworld. So because we have more than one piece of criteria, for this we would use some ifs. Now, this is structured slightly different. They're asking you for the sum range first, whereas in sum if, sum range comes last. So I actually find this a bit easier to understand. So the first thing you do is tell it what you want to sum. So I want to sum the total sales and then we specify our criteria. Well, my first piece of criteria is micro world. So the range that I'm going to find that in is the company range. My criteria is micro world. It then moves on to criteria range two. Well, the next thing I'm looking for is sales reps. So my criteria range is the job title range. And my criteria is sales rep. Now, again, I have these written out in cells. You could type in the text if you wanted to. I wouldn't recommend hard coding things. I'd always try and use a cell reference wherever possible. But if you are in a situation where you have to, it's perfectly fine to type out the word sales rep. Close the bracket, hit enter. And there we have our result. Again, we'll just do the final one here. We've got three pieces of criteria. So again, we would use some ifs. A sum range is going to be the total sales. Criteria range one is going to be the company. Our criteria is microworld. Criteria range two is going to be the job title. And our criteria is sales rep. Now, criteria range three, we're only looking, we only want to sum sales that are greater than 7,000. So our criteria range is going to be the total sales again. And we want to say greater than 7,000. Close the bracket, hit enter, and we get our answer. Okay, so that is some if and some ifs. We have count ifs and uh, count if, and we also have average ifs and average if, but they work in a very similar way. If you can understand how some ifs are constructed, then you can pretty much do a count ifs as well. And if I just show you, if we go to count if, it's very, very similar. If I wanted to count uh, the number of employees at Computech, I would just select the range and criteria. So my criteria is Computech, my range is going to be the company, and there is my criteria. So very, very similar. So I'm going to leave you to have a practice with those in the spreadsheet in your own time. As I said, I am very conscious that we only have 10 minutes left. I don't know where the time has gone. Let's move on to the next topic. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit absolutely everything in in the next 10 minutes. So I'm just trying to think, what shall we do here? You know what? I'm going to jump across to filter and Lambda because they are very new functions and I think probably something that you've never seen before. And I think I've done ifs a few times previously. We can save ifs for another webinar. Let's jump across to filter and fit these in. Now again, filter is one of the newer functions in Excel. Now, if you're wondering if you have filter, an easy way to check is click in any cell in your copy of Excel type in the word filter. And if you can see the arguments underneath, then you have access to that formula. You should have it if you're using Microsoft 365 and also the latest version of the standalone version. So Excel 2021. If you don't have it at the moment, I'm sorry about that, but you probably will have it very soon the next time your Excel gets updated. So it's always good to have a little head start knowledge on some of these new functions. 
Now, how do we use filter and why would we want to use filter? Well, if we take a look at our data table here, we have some students, we have uh, the exams that they sat, we have the grade that they achieved, and we have the date. And notice that I have some little filters at the top here. So I think we're all fairly familiar with applying filters to tables so that we can filter for things like, I want to see everybody who sat the French exam, I can simply apply a filter. Very simple and straightforward. So why do we need to have filter in a function when we already have it here? Well, when I use filter in a table like this, I can only use it in this table. I can't essentially export my filtered list out to another part of my spreadsheet and use that. I also can't really combine it with any other formulas. And when I filter, it also hides rows. So if I have anything next to this, it's going to hide those rows and that can sometimes cause problems. So there's a few reasons there why you might prefer to use a filter function. And it is pretty cool. So let me show you how it works. Now, what I have in here in the middle here in column F is I have some filter criteria. So maybe I want to find out, first of all, or I want to create a filtered list of all of the students that sat the English exam. So what I can do here is I can type in equals filter. The first thing you need to specify here is the array. So that is the information that you want to return. Now, I'm interested in seeing, I want to see everybody who sat the English exam, but I want to see all of the information. I want to see the student name, the exam, the grade, and the date. So my array is going to be everything in this table. So I'm going to select the first row, Control, Shift, down arrow. So I want to select that entire table of data. That's my array. The next argument is include. So this is where you basically tell Excel what your filter is. So my filter is going to be that the exam must equal English. OK, so I want to include. I need to select the exam column again. Control shift down arrow. This needs to equal what I have in cell F4. Close the bracket, hit enter. There I get my list of filtered results. And the cool thing about this is that because it is a function, I can combine it with other functions to make this even more complex. And we are going to do that in a moment. What about if I want to uh, maybe, uh, maybe apply two filters to this list? So maybe I want to see everybody who sat the, let's see, everybody who sat the maths exam. Um, oh, sorry, everybody who failed the maths exam. Let's say that. So two pieces of criteria. Well, let's delete this out. Let's type in equals filter. My array, well, it's going to be the same thing. I want to return all of this information. Control shift down arrow. Comma. What do I want to include? Now, if I have more than one piece of criteria, so I'm going to have two in this example, I need to put them inside brackets. So if I open a bracket, my first piece of criteria is the exam. So control shift down arrow to select the exam column. That needs to equal whatever we have in here. That's my first piece of criteria. I then need to type in an asterisk. Now, in this case, when we're using filter, an asterisk means and. So I'm saying return everybody who sat the maths exam and who failed that maths exam effectively. So my next piece of criteria, I need to put in brackets again. This time, I'm looking for the grade. So let's select. Control shift down arrow to select that column. That needs to equal what we have in F12. Close the bracket. Now notice that I also have, if I press comma, I have another optional argument for filter. And that is if it doesn't find anything, so if nothing matches this filter criteria, what do we want it to say in the cell? You could leave it empty, but it's going to throw up an error and make your spreadsheet look messy. So I always like to put in something like no records if it can't find anything. That is it. Let's hit enter. And there we go. We get our filtered list using two pieces of criteria. And of course, I have these on a, a data validation drop down so I can then go in and my filter is going to update. What I could also do is let me change this back to a slightly longer list. Let's go to fail. What I could do here is I could combine it with another function. So there is another new function in Excel called sort. So if I wanted to sort this list into alphabetical order by the student name, I'm going to go up to the formula bar 
and are going to say, OK, I want to filter, but I also want to sort it. But the first argument for sort is array. Now, that's basically the information we see here. That's going to be generated by this filter formula. So if we click right at the end and press comma, we then need to specify the sort index. So this is which column we want to sort by. So I want to sort by the student name. So that is column number one, similar to VLOOKUP in that way, in numbers columns from left to right, comma. Do I want to sort in ascending or descending order? Well, I'm going to say ascending this time. I'm just going to put a one on the end there. Let's close it off, hit enter. And now I've got that list sorted as well. OK, so a couple of newer functions there, filter. Have a little look at those. I would recommend really taking a look into filter because we used an asterisk here to say and when we're using two pieces of criteria. But you could use a plus to specify an or. And there's other little operators you can use in there to create different types of filters. I would highly recommend reading through the help pages available within Excel on filter if that's if that looks like a, a formula that you might want to use. All right, guys, how long do we have left? Let's have about four minutes, right? I'm going to try and cover lambdas in four minutes, <laughs> even though this is probably the most complex one. <laughs> but, uh, let's give it a go. And uh, if you like this, we can do another one of these sessions where we can go through some of uh, the other more advanced formulas. Now, as I mentioned, Lambda, one of the newest functions available in Excel released in the last six months. There was a big fuss about it on LinkedIn, a big fuss about it with all the Excel people on YouTube because it is such a game changing formula. It allows you to create your own formulas. Now, I'm going to show you a very simple example, because if you're not used to working with things like variables and parameters, you may find this a bit confusing, but we're going to do it simply. I'm going to go through it slowly. And when I say slowly, I'm going to try and squeeze it into four minutes <laughs> so that you understand what you're doing. And then you can have a little practice and a play around with it. So what exactly is a lambda? Well, it's basically a, a formula which we can convert into a lambda. And then we can create a function based off of that lambda. Now, I can't explain it to you any clearer. The best way to look at this is to take a look at an example. So what I have here is I just have some very basic sales prices in here, just some random numbers. And what I want to do is I want to apply a 20% sales tax rate to these numbers. Now, if I was just doing this using formulas, there's a couple of ways I could do it. I could say equals, maybe do sales price multiplied by and then because I don't have 20% written out in a column, I'm going to say one plus 20%. That is a way that we can work out price sales tax and that's going to give us that total. OK, now if we take a look at this formula, we have B8 multiplied by one plus 20. Now what we can do with this is we can change this into a lambda. OK, now bear with me. <laughs> I'm going to delete this out. We're going to come to this first cell and we're going to type in equals a lambda. Now, the only argument we have here is parameter or calculation. And parameters are very similar to variables. And what you're basically doing when you're setting up a variable is you can you can assign a I'm just trying to think of the best way to explain this. You can assign a meaningful name to a, a number or a cell in a worksheet. You can even assign it to a range of cells. So in this context, if we're using that formula that we just did, B8 multiplied by 1 plus 20 percent, what I could say is I want to set up a parameter that refers to cell B8. OK, now B8 contains my uh, my sales. Uh, so I'm going to put in here or my price, I should say my sales price. So I'm going to give cell B8 a name. I'm going to declare that parameter, first of all, comma. I can set up another parameter. We're not going to at this stage, or I can do a calculation. So now I could do my calculation. So as I said before, we could do price, because that's going to be B8 multiplied by, and then I think it was 1 plus 20% we did. Oops, I just need to close. Need to, no, need to close off two. 
Okay, so I've set up price at the beginning and I'm saying that that refers to B8 and then I'm using that in this calculation. So instead of B8, I'm using price, a meaningful name, and then I'm doing the rest of the calculation. Now, if I just hit enter here, I'm going to get a calc error because I haven't told Excel what price refers to. Currently, the calculation doesn't know that price refers to cell B8. So on the end of your lambda, you need to open a bracket and tell it that it refers to B8. OK, so now when I hit enter, I should get exactly the same result. Now, we've just done it for one of them just here. Now, I could choose to declare another parameter. So if I take a look at my formula, I've got price multiplied by 1 plus 20 percent. So maybe I want to make 20 percent a parameter as well. So I'm going to come back to here where we have price and I'm going to declare a second parameter or a second variable. and I'm just going to call it tax. I'm going to go straight to the end of the formula and tell Excel what tax refers to. So where I have B8, I'm then going to say, well, tax means 20%. I can then replace 20% in this formula with the word tax. Okay. Enter. We should get the same result. So we've used a lambda to declare variables and then use those variables in a calculation. Now you might be thinking, OK, well, why would I want to do that? Well, this is how we can then take this information and create our own formula to use on comparable data. And it doesn't necessarily have to be that we want 20 percent every single time. I can use this formula if I want to work out what 10 percent is or what 40 percent is. So what we can now do is we can take our lambda and I'm going to do this in the formula bar and you don't need to copy all of the lambda. You don't need this last part where we tell Excel what these uh, what these variables refer to. We only need the machine, the processing part, everything before. Control C to copy it. We then go to the formulas tab and we're going to go into name manager and create a new name for our formula. So maybe I want to call this function name price plus tax and I can paste formula into here. So now when I click on OK, check out what happens. I've created a function in Excel that's available throughout this workbook. So now if I type in equals, if I want to know what 20 percent of this is, I can use my new function. So if I start to type in price, can you see it's listed there along with all of the other functions in Excel? When I press tab, those variables I declared now become the arguments for my function. So I now just need to tell Excel what price I'm using. So I want to say cell B8 and what the tax rate is. And I don't have to use 20 percent. I could use 40, oh, not 440, 40 percent, for example. And now I get my result and I can reuse that on other data that it is comparable. So if you can sort of start to think this is a very basic example, you can use this in so many different ways. Start to see how powerful this is to be able to create different formulas that you can use throughout your workbook. OK, hopefully that hasn't squeezed your mind too much. I'm going to leave it there. I know we didn't cover if and and. I will try and cover that in one of our later webinars. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To see the full course that this video came from, click over there. And click over there to see more videos from Simon Says It.